Given the vast number of FDA-approved multi-drug regimens for the treatment of multiple myeloma, how do we approach the individual needs of each patient to obtain optimal and durable responses for those both with newly diagnosed disease and relapsed multiple myeloma? In this OncLive peer exchange panel, discussion navigating evolving therapy choice in multiple myeloma, my colleagues and I will review the new data from ASCO 2019 to shed light on how to improve outcomes for our patients. I'm Dr. Sagar Lonial, Chief Medical Officer of the Winship Cancer Institute, and I'm also the Ann and Bernard Gray Family Chair in Cancer and the Professor and Chair in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Participating today on our panel are Dr. Amrita Krishnan, Director of the Judy and Bernard Briskin Center for Multiple Myeloma Research and Professor in the Department of Hematology and Hematopoietic Cell Transplantation at the City of Hope National Medical Center, Duarte, California. Dr. Thomas Martin, Clinical Professor of Medicine in the Adult Leukemia and Bone Marrow Transplantation Program, Co-Director of the Myeloma Program at the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center in San Francisco, California. Dr. Krina Patel, Assistant Professor in the Department of Lymphoma Myeloma, Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And Dr. Saad Usmani, Clinical Professor of Medicine at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Medicine, Chief of the Plasma Cell Disorders Program and Director of Clinical Research in the Hematologic Malignancies at the Levine Cancer Center Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you for joining us. Let's begin. Welcome. So let's start off talking about smoldering. There was a lot of really interesting discussions on smoldering. How do we make decisions, Krina? Perhaps you'll get us started on treatment, observation. How do you sort of frame that paradigm? Sure. So I guess before today, um, the majority of my patients that come to me with smoldering myeloma, um, mostly it's observation, you know, or clinical trials. So if we have clinical trials for high-risk patients, usually um, we'll put them on clinical trial. I think the questions are, you know, toxicity um, versus any kind of efficacy. Um, most of my patients want something to be done because they know they have cancer. Mm -hmm. But if you talk to them and say, well, this is something we can observe um, and probably watch because I don't know I can make your life longer by treating, um, they get excited that I, I cannot do any treatment, right? Um, I don't have to have side effects potentially. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, the biggest struggle. Um, do I do something that's gonna help me in the future or do I, do I just watch it? Um, and I think it depends on the patient. So I have some patients who are very savvy and you know, even if they have a progression-free survival, they want something. I think those are the patients I tend to make sure I put on clinical trials, and maybe those are the patients, based on our discussion later, um, that I will treat. Mm -hmm. um, I think another group would be older patients. Um, you know, if they're 80 and have a little bit of benzoin protein, creatinine is 1.2, um, I don't want them to have renal failure. Um, maybe that's the patient that I would treat with Revlimid um, or something, you know, a little bit simpler to avoid um, uh, organ damage. Um, but if I have younger patients, you know, I, I think I have a hard time without a clinical trial saying, oh, all my high-risk patients should definitely be on um, some type of therapy, um, especially intermediate or, or you know, um, um, low-risk smoldering patients. So Tom, let's talk before ASCO 2019, what was sort of on the menu of things that one could do if you were worried about risk of progression or organ failure in a sort of borderline smoldering patient? Well, I would say for, first off, the things that people should do is, first of all, not look at the snapshot. Not look at the snapshot the first time you see somebody and take what their M protein is or what their bone marrow plasma cells are, or what the free light chain ratio shows, and decide at that point in time to treat people. I do think with all smoldering myeloma patients, we have to look at the, at the movie. Uh, and whether the movie's three months, six months, nine months, or 12 months of evaluation to try to find out, is this somebody that you think is progressing or will progress? And how high is their risk of developing these organ damage you know, phenomenon? Um, in my personal um, practice, I look at that, I look at the movie and everybody. I think you know, we're hearing a lot of different ways to treat these patients. We'll talk about it a little bit in a minute. Lenalidomide alone, lenalidomide plus dexamethasone, uh, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, and a transplant and maintenance and you know, further therapy for, for several years. So um, I would say I would caution everybody right now, I don't know we know what the best therapy is. I think if people are going to um, be at risk for progression, we should treat them like we would treat a patient with multiple myeloma. 
So the movie analogy is very Southern California. So when you get there, we'll see if she makes a wine analogy. So Saad, we heard some new discussions at this meeting on ways to risk stratify that smoldering patient population and perhaps other ways to stratify patients in general based on biomarkers. You want to give us a little bit of information on that? Uh, sure, Sagar. I'm going to actually piggyback on what Tom said. I think, you know, we've kind of struggled with how best to stratify patients within the smoldering myeloma uh, situation. Uh, we've, we've attempted to do this uh, in a snapshot way, looking at bone marrow plasma cytosis, M spike value, and, and, and light chain ratios. Um, I have to say I was, um, you know, a little disappointed in, in, in the data that was uh, shared today um, in the Jesus and Miguel uh, effort. Um, this effort started almost two years ago, you know, of collecting data from uh, all over the, over the world at, at major myeloma centers. And, and it's probably the largest cohort of smoldering myeloma patients that has been collected over 2,000 patients. Um, and, and I think the initial intent was to look at uh, not just those static uh, time points, but but see the dynamics of, of how patients actually progress from the smoldering myeloma to ac active disease. And I think um, some of my critique uh, is, is on that. So, so based on ROC analyses, uh, you know, the group did come up with um, three risk factors, uh, an M spike of two grams, uninvolved involved light chain ratio of 20, and bone marrow plasma cytosis of 20% or higher, um, and then stratified patients to high, intermediate, uh, or low risk based on, on those three features, um, and, and did that successfully. But it still doesn't answer, you know, that the dynamics of, of how these numbers move. And, you know, I'm, I'm still struggling with, with how to reconcile that. So Saad, what about looking at BCMA or other biomarkers as predictors of that transition from smoldering to symptomatic disease? Yeah, I think looking at those kind of uh, biomarkers is going to be important. I think you're alluding to the Angela Dispensieri uh, data where they looked at uh, serum BCMA levels in MGUS, smoldering and active myeloma patients. And again, with ROC curve analyses uh, deemed that the 75 nanogram per deciliter um, uh, or higher um, serum BCMA levels correlated with that progression. Uh, and patients who had a lower BCMA, serum BCMA level, they were true MGUS patients. Yeah. So I think have, incorporating those kind of uh, biomarkers along with uh, cytogenetic data that inform us about disease biology are going to be important um, in, in the overall risk stratification.